Um, welcome, first off, to Stillwater FFA. Uh, my name is Bailey Cleaver. I'm one of the ag teachers here at Stillwater, and I get the opportunity, I guess, to talk to you about CDEs. I had some handouts. I printed 35. I think there's more than 35 people here today, so that's awesome. Um, they're working their way back. We're also going to have a shared drive, so if you don't get a handout, obviously I'll make sure you get it. You can come find me after and I can shoot it to you in an email. Nothing that I'm giving you is like groundbreaking or world changing, but if you want it, I can get it to you. Um, first of all, just to kind of start, a lot of you in this room can run circles around me in terms of CDEs. Like I feel a little overwhelmed because a lot of you or all of you, but some of you more seasoned ag teachers are very good at your job. And I just completed my sixth year of teaching, but it feels like year one. And I am not saying that I do it right or the best. This is just the way and things that I have found to make some things work for me. Yes, I am at Stillwater FFA currently. Um, there's three of us, which is a very different dynamic than some people. I also taught in Burns Flat, Dill City for two years and Cheyenne, Oklahoma. So I've been in the tiniest of the tiny single teacher programs and now a huge overwhelming program with Stillwater. So I understand maybe some of the challenges of both aspects of single teacher and um, large schools. So that's kind of my background. Um, and so we're just gonna kind of have some informal discussions maybe about CDEs and what works for me and maybe helping you guys find an idea and go from there. Um, the first thing, like I said, I'm not the expert. I'm just going to tell you what I do and if it works for me, great. Maybe you find one or two things that works for you and we'll go from there. Um, first thing that I would say with CDEs um, is it is overwhelming because there's a lot. Like if you pull up the guidelines or whatever from OSU's website like there's a whole lot on there plus there's a lot that aren't on there like to be in a successful program if you're trying to be successful you're gonna feel the pressure to do a lot I feel like maybe not but as an ag teacher I felt that way before of like I have to do everything and maybe the best thing I can say is set kind of a realistic expectation to start when I was at Burns Flat in my first year of teaching, I knew I wasn't going to have 10 teams, um, but what two or three could we do really well that the students wanted to do and would latch on to doing? So that's kind of my first baseline, I guess I could say. It's like, what realistically can we do? And what realistically can we be somewhat successful at? Because I'm motivated by success. I'm sure your students are motivated by success a little bit, so you don't just want to go get beat all the time because it is a contest after all, right? But what realistically can we do and can we have some success at? So that's the first thing. And that maybe is an internal reflection of you and knowing your program. Um, what am I good at teaching? What can these kids realistically do, et cetera, if that makes sense. Um, one thing that I think we do at Stillwater FFA that really helps us is we start the fall sometimes it's later than we want um, but we try to do it in september ish um, we have like a cde fair um, or some sort of kind of a recruitment for cdes in terms of like our spring cd contest so the judgings the um you know whatever we're going to do at state interscholastics in april we have a recruitment event in the fall. So we have the arena out here where we started this morning. We will have a typically older member, somebody who has done the team before, like um, somebody who was on my AgCom team the previous year is going to host the AgCom booth. Somebody who loves floriculture is gonna host the floriculture booth. And so what we do is set up a table out there and we try to bring in a fun component of the contest. So with um, floor culture, we brought in some real plants and had them do a quick ID. You know, we would bring in um, for horse judging one year, we brought in a computer with reining horses on the screen um, performing 
because you know everybody loves a rainy horse to do a sliding stop we showed the kids that and gave them opportunity to say hey if you really like horses you could be judging this um, and so try to give them a fun component of the CDE event um, and we encourage them to go to each table try out each different one a small component and then that kind of piques their interest hopefully some it does not some it does um, and that night at the CDE fair we have a sign up of every team we think we would be willing to have that year and those students before they leave the CDE fair they sign up for whichever team they are interested in competing on okay um, obviously we have 230 plus members that works here when I was at Burns Flat that might have looked totally different because um, I had 70 students right um, but we encourage them to sign up for where they want to um, compete we get take those lists as the three of us ag teachers sit down and say which teams are going to make where do we need to fill in some students realistically what's going to work here what's not and then we set a practice time um, and so at our first practice we try to get all of those team members together and set a schedule to practice we try to put a law on the kids like hey this is your team you're going to be as successful as you make it you're going to set the practice schedule y'all need to figure it out sometimes that works sometimes we don't have a practice until february but you know it's a fine line between making things work and letting them figure it out so we try to balance um, that as well as we possibly can but that's kind of how we get them started on a cde in terms of the spring cdes is we give them kind of a recruitment event where they get to try it out um, obviously mr branscombe who y'all have met possibly today he does the eighth and ninth grade classes here so he does a very good job of encouraging participation for our young students and getting them excited to do that and then between the three of us we kind of split our interest areas or maybe not necessarily interest areas but where we're naturally already fit in like i teach ag communications so it makes sense that i coach the ag communications team i manage the greenhouse with my floriculture or greenhouse classes so it's naturally a fit for me to teach the flor floriculture cde teams as well so that's kind of how we get started any questions on that anything no if you have a question throughout just ask away um, it's boring for me to just talk at you so this is an open discussion um, so if you do have a question go ahead and let me know whenever that comes up um, but that's how we get them started now I keep saying spring CDEs because that's kind of the big ones we think of but we love opening ceremonies here like I I love opening ceremonies I think it's really fun there's discussion on that you can fall on whatever side of the debate you want I think it's fun um, the quiz and the um, green hand I guess contest in the fall you guys know you're back at school boom we need to be getting those started um, and so for us what works is it's kind of not an option for freshmen they do that in class in terms of they don't necessarily get assigned a part in class but they are very much introduced to FFA history in class they are very much introduced to what opening ceremonies looks like in class and they get to practice play or whatever i think mr branscombe lets them do it in an accent one day you know lets them try whatever to make it fun but they go through and perform opening ceremonies for fun as an eight, as a freshman in class our eighth graders are just they don't understand you know you've all seen the eighth graders the big eyes and just they are precious little humans who don't know the outside door from the inside door so we're trying to just get them to love ffa and ag education so we don't overwhelm them with that there's clearly some that get on our teams and we're like come you're going to be great and they all have the option 
It's just, we don't introduce that in class up front to our eighth graders because that's too much. We just want them to come back to us the next day as an eighth grader and not get lost on the bus because they do have to ride a bus out here. Um, but what we do is we have a back to school bash as an FFA meeting to kick off. Y'all probably all have a kickoff meeting of some sort. And so our officers do opening ceremonies at that event. And so it's really cool when they see our chapter officers in their official dress leading opening ceremonies that instantly is like, hey, I want to be that, hopefully, right? And so then they'll want to do opening ceremonies. For us, we have a tryout because um, we can only take so many kids. Um, obviously to the jackpot contest, hopefully we are out of the pandemic and I don't have to deal with that anymore. Last year we didn't get to go to very many contests, but hopefully this year we're going to go to all of them because I'm so tired of sitting at home. But um, we can do, we do as many teams as kids want to do basically. The deal for us is we try to emphasize from a young age, so it starts with the opening ceremonies, eighth and ninth graders, that this is not easy. You are not handed success because you just show up, right? We're gonna practice and we're going to do the best that we possibly can. So a lot of our opening ceremonies practices are in the morning, which is not fun for Miss Cleaver. <laughs> Cause I like to sleep and I'm rolling up right at 7.30 when we start practice, but we'll meet them here at 7.30. If we have four opening ceremonies teams, sometimes we do two teams a time, you know, team blue and team gold practice at 7.30, team white and team black practice at after school. Um, we wanna give those kids as much opportunity to go through it. It does nobody good to have one team performing opening ceremonies and three teams over here messing around, right? So we try to get as much actual practice with those teams as possible. But we set outside of school practice and if you can do whatever you wanna do, do your own method. But we feel like having the practices outside of class time makes them come a little bit more serious, makes it a standard of like you have to perform. We give them critiques, you know, try to build them to be as successful as possible. And we try to start it at a young age, eighth and ninth graders, you're practicing, you're working, you're putting in the work. It doesn't, success just doesn't come. And that bleeds over into other areas of the CE teams. Um, let's see, in your little packet, I think I'm kind of going out of order, but in the very back or next to last page, third page from the back, there we go, try that. We do, well, we is very not true. Mr. Branscombe is the goat of social media. If you are friends with him on social media, you will know that he is so good. Someday he's gonna be a PR director for some huge firm probably and make lots of money and we'll all wanna be his best friend. But the our Stillwater FFA page one way that we try to be very transparent with these students is give them a schedule at the start of the week. So typically he schedules it for Sunday or sometimes Saturday. He'll schedule the post and we call it our weekly update. Okay. And on this weekly update, it has everything for the most part that Stillwater FFA is doing that week. And I know this saves me. I know it saves Mr. Nipper, it saves Mr. Branscombe. We had, you know, when we have people coming out here to help us or whatever, it saves them as well. You can go look at the weekly update, know exactly what's going on. A lot of our students are very busy. And so they forget that they have floor culture on Wednesday at 4.30 after school. So if they see that, it helps them. Um, I don't do a great job of this, but my teaching partners do of putting the weekly update up on their screen to start class. Um, every day that's just their first slide so kids can get that once again in front of their face we have stillwaterffa.com um, that we update or try to update and so we'll put the weekly update on stillwaterffa.com as well and it just helps us keep everything in line if we're expecting them to be at practice if we're expecting them to show up and put in effort here you go you have no excuse 
to not know when that practice is. So that's just one little thing that has helped us is doing a weekly update. So if you have a social media page for your chapter, whatever it is, um, it's not super hard. I think he makes these on PowerPoint. Um, we just communicate with Mr. Bransom on what we have going for that week. He builds the PowerPoint, puts it on social media, schedules it. Hmm. Can I add something? Yeah. And the thing about this is great for us. A lot of our students that we coach on teams, I've never had any class. Uh, because there's three of us, Mr. Bransom has only for eighth and ninth grade. And so a lot of those kids that I've never had in class, I may not have ever met them. That way we can bridge that communication gap that may not be there otherwise. Yeah. Cool. Questions on the weekly update? Pretty straightforward. It's not really groundbreaking. Like I said, y'all can all run circles around me, but I'm just going to try to give you the best that I can. Um, specifically, this is why CDEs are hard is because we all have our own area that like we feel really confident in. Like I feel fairly confident in floor culture. I grew up only doing livestock judging. That was my CDE for every year, nine years old to 18. So I feel very confident in livestock judging. Um, and that's kind of it you know um, so we could all go around the room and say yeah I'm really good at this yeah I'm really good at this and that's fine so I'm gonna kind of give you some specifics that I do to the CDEs that I'm in charge of um, and then I'm sure you have a buddy you're sitting next to that at the end of this you can pick their brain about something I don't talk about so let's be honest I do nothing with ag mechanics I really don't want to so thanks Mr. Nipper for being a great teaching partner but um, at the back of your packet, I have included some ag communication stuff because I do coach that team when we have it. Um, the fun parts of ag communication is the judging, right? Everybody likes the judging because we can talk about it, hash it out, you're right, I'm wrong. So um, it's photos every year, right? You're, they're always going to judge a class of photos at this point that I've been teaching it. So this was actually the class of photos that um, I used at the central area, interscholastics. Um, somehow I got put in charge of this contest, so I made a class of photos. Um, and what's really cool is I teach at Com as well. So we have some chapter cameras and we'll spend quite a bit of time on photography. And it's always more fun to go walk around than sit on your hind end. So we go around our 20 acres taking pictures of different things. Like one day they'll have to do a nature photo. One day we go down to the barn and we pretend we are a picturing livestock for a sale and they have to do livestock photos. One day we'll go whatever, random, I think of at the moment. Um, so I have these photos on my Google. So when I'm about to do ad calm practice at 4.30 and it's 4.15 and ah, I'm not ready, I can go to my Google Drive, pull off four similar photos, and they can judge the photos just like they were in a contest. So your copies were copied, not printed from my computer because technology and me, I'm like an 80 year old when I'm only 28. But um, so they all look blurry. I promise you they're not, but it's good to have a really high quality photo you know, one that maybe is kind of an obvious bottom end and then a middle pair, or however you want to do it. I try to give them scenarios that could come up at the contest. Two really good photos, you know, one really bad one, kind of make them decide. Um, so I just build these. I just have this template, plug in four photos, print it. We're ready for practice that day. Um, the graphics class is the one on the back. And every year it changes. AgCom specifically has done a workshop in the spring every year. Um, Shelly sitting at OSU has done a workshop where she goes through exactly what that is for that year. So my first year doing AgCom, it was logos. Last year with COVID and the year before, I kind of think they just morphed. It was these like print ads. Um, so. I just found similar, I didn't do a super great job, I guess, because they're kind of all different, but they're all Farm Bureau. So similar ones and make a class of graphics. Um, I think we're gonna have a Google Drive at the end that everybody gets. I have a lot of just like random 
Google Slides where I put logos on a slide and made a class or graphics that I'll put in that drive if you're interested and then that way you'll have five or six classes ready to go for you to teach this in AgCom practice. That's specific to AgCom. Some of you may never intend to teach AgCom, that's fine. Um, but if you want them, they'll be there and available, okay? All right, the other one that I do is floor culture, which I thought I would despise. I actually kind of like it, it's not terrible. Um, so we play with the flowers and all the things. Um, the hardest thing for me with floor culture is there's 131 plants that they have to ID. And I guess I'm not a very good student because I don't want to sit down and learn 131 plants with them. Like that sounds horrendous. So we try to do it in fun ways. Um, we have the buzzers for uh, Quiz Bowl. And so I'll set up the buzzers depending on my class size. And once we've kind of gone through them and they know a little bit about what is on the 131 plants and can name some of them, we'll play IDs with the buzzers um, and make it a contest in class. Typically, my floriculture students are also in my greenhouse class. So if there's a day that we don't have something major going on in the greenhouse, we'll play with the buzzers and do an ID. And they get really, really competitive and like try to kill each other and it's great. I encourage that, you know, destruction among the children and son. But they, um, we do it with the buzzers. We'll try to have as many real plants as possible. Um, I am not the best at storing stock plants in my greenhouse. Luckily, a lot of stuff that we sell in our greenhouse sells, plant sales. There's a handful, 30 of them or 20 that are also on that ID list. So I already start with 20 or 30 plants in my greenhouse before, you know, too long into the spring semester. So that's good. Walmart always in the spring has a lot of the ones on that list. Um, and then at some points, it, I put it on the kids. Um, guys, y'all are going to be as good at this as you want to be. Here's my PowerPoints. Study these. You know, when you're driving and when your parents driving and you're sitting in the car, study them. Um, if you go to Lowe's, walk around and see how many you can name. Shock your parents that they're actually learning stuff, right? So I try to encourage as much on them learning as possible. Um, for me, practice can be challenging because I have them for an hour, hour and 20 minutes. What do I do with them to hold their attention and learn? Um, especially in those type, like where we have a test, an ID, a practicum, which is most of our CDEs um, in Oklahoma. So I try to spend 20 minutes on a test, specifically to Floriculture. Texas FFA has a huge test bank that gives them a lot of different stuff. So I'll print 30 questions off the Texas test bank, practice one. We'll go through those 30. Okay, those 30, that 30 minutes is done. We did 30 questions. Now we're gonna do some IDs with the buzzers and you get to have fun. Okay, that took 30 minutes, we're done. The last 10 minutes of this practice, we're gonna walk in the greenhouse and you're gonna try to ID as many as possible. So just trying to vary it up. Um, we don't always do testing. We don't always do IDs. I try to give them each piece of the contest at each practice if I can, if that makes sense. Uh, we've done milk quality. Mr. Branson was technically in charge of that, so I just got to be a student because I love cheese. So it would always be a contest of if they could ID more cheeses than this cleaver. Um, we had a quiz bowl team my first year here of really um, fun, I guess, students that love to play. So it would be me and Mr. Nipper on a team versus the, and sometimes it's a Branscombe, against the four students. Um, so the more you can play with them and humble them and make them respect you, I guess, the better it goes as well. Um, the hard stuff about some of these contests, I cannot make a floral bow to save my life. Um, this is not me. This is not anything to do with me. Um, and so luckily here, there's lots of resources for me to use. So I called um, somebody I knew from college who buys from our plant cell. So one day she was here at the plant cell and I was like, oh my gosh, hey, 
do you know anybody to make floral blows for me? And she's like, well, my mom owned a floral shop for years and now she lives in Stillwater. Please bring her. So one day for all of practice, Miss K came, brought everything that we needed and she tied floral bows with the kids the entire hour of practice. It was also the day of our regional speech contest. So I was trying to get kids in official dress, hear their speech one more time, get myself in clothes to go to, you know, regional speech contest and have a practice because those kids weren't giving speeches. So in that aspect, it worked out great because I could do things I needed to do while she was also teaching them floral bows and they all learned it. If I was teaching them, it would be a hot mess disaster and we'd still be trying to learn it. So the more you can find people to plug in and maybe not everything, cause I guess like as an ag teacher, you're probably a control freak like I am. I don't want to hand everything over, but there are certain things that make my life easy to hand over. Um, and granted, yes, we are in Stillwater where there is lots of resources, but when I was at Burns Flat, um, there was a guy who has a meat processing facility that came through OSU. He wanted to train a meat judging team, you know, and we tried it just kind of was slow going. Um, but there are people out there in your community, maybe that aren't doing the specific area that you want to do, but I guarantee you, you can find somebody to help you. I know you've all heard that spiel. I know that's old and boring and you're like, that's more work for me to find them. I'm sorry. That's just what I have done. Okay. The last thing that's most of your packet and it's kind of, the big thing to tackle, like I said, I did livestock judging from when I was nine to when I was 18. Loved it, it was my favorite thing. Well, one of my favorite things about FFA. And we had some success and it was fun. I think that kids can learn a lot through livestock judging. We as the three ag teachers at Stillwater are a little hesitant to just throw that out there and be like, yeah, we're putting a livestock judging team together because one, you know, you don't have success most of the time if you just start. Some of you might have started a team of seniors and they went and won. That's great. Power to you. I don't know that I could do that. Um, and we here don't get to see much of the 4-H students. Um, our 4-H program is structured a little differently. And so like at our local show, kids will show up with animals that we have no idea who they are and they're going to be our future FFA members. So it makes it really hard. And there's like six 4-H clubs in Stillwater. So it makes it very hard. But I had some parents who were like, hey, we want our kids to livestock judge. And I said, great, I want to coach a team because I loved it. And so COVID, maybe this was a blessing from COVID as much as I despised it, is it gave me time because we were not in school. I was here every day with no students and two hours of teaching, so that's not very much. So I was able to start training this 4-H team of livestock judges. Oh, and your screen went down right as I was about to show them. But um, for me, it's a big chunk, right? Like this is a lot of information. If you don't come in with a livestock background, it's hard, right? And I did livestock judging and after my first, second, third practice with these kids, I would call my father. Thankfully I have him as a resource and be like, I don't know how you taught my group of nine year olds how to do this. Like this is hard. <laughs> um, so what I did when I started was I said, how do I make this as simple for parents and kids as I can? And so I was really excited to do this. I sat down one day and built this livestock judging manual. Some of you might look at it and be like, this is trash, that's fine. Some of you might really like it, take it, leave it, whatever. It's kind of my redneck version of how I would teach them livestock judging. Like, what am I looking for? How do I make this simple for you little guys? So I kind of explained, and I would say if you have a team you're gonna start, like let's say you wanna do a meets team, bring your 4-Hers on board. You know, there is the meets contest for 4-H students as well. Some of the other ones there's not necessarily, but if I started a team of eighth graders on floor culture and my vision is by the time they're junior seniors, we should be competing for that top spot at state. I might make them a resource guide like this that they bring to every practice just so we have a foundation. I think that's the biggest thing. If we can all start here, then I can start building you up to where I need you to be, if that makes sense. So I went through and explained it because they didn't even know what they didn't know. 
Um, I put this whole thing in a binder. I gave them a binder with this livestock judging manual, a steno book, and a pencil. And I said, here is everything you need to start. Parents, make sure you read this with them and bring this back to me every time you come to practice. And so far they've done pretty good. Um, so kind of what our goal is, what you're gonna do, broke it down like they didn't even know what classes they were going to be judging so put that in there if you were doing a ag mechanic cde and you had a group of eighth graders you might put in here you know you're going to do a test you're going to do tools you're going to do a welding component or whatever i don't really know ag mechanics but make it specific to whatever contest you want to start them at um, put the terms on here because when I'm talking sometimes I'm not very good at like hey y'all remember where the stifle is or whatever um, And then I went through and try to show them good and bad and then I refer back to this like if we're judging a class And I'm like hey remember that red heifer that was our example of being Structurally correct in our book think of that try to let them start associating the picture in their brain because we know that livestock judging is picturing that animal in your brain when you're giving reasons or when we're talking it later like I want them to be able to recall that picture right so starting that skill here with these pictures um, I just took Google and put little lines in there or not Google word put little lines on there to show like angles and all that so I did a good example a bad example tried to get every species some are very hard. I know that pig's a little short hip, but what is? Um, goats, the goat people in the room, y'all need to do a better job of getting goats on Google searches because they don't exist. It was very hard. I don't know why, but I started looking for goats and I was like, I know there's high quality goats in Oklahoma. Why are they not showing up on this search? And they were not. So anyway, broke it down by what I want them to look for. So. If you put your priorities elsewhere, make this fit you. For me, I want to start with structure. Then we're going to look at the dimensions of the animal. You know, are they three-dimensional? Do they have rib shape with dimension? Um, so kind of tried to highlight that on here for them to see it. Because sometimes I think I, I can see it because I did it. They can't see it. So tried to highlight it in a way that was easy for them, um, etc. I'm not saying this is the best thing to ever use. But it did help me kind of get my kids... Um, started and have some consistency to what we're looking for if that makes sense um, like I said it's my redneck version so I kind of did some screenshotting of animals walking on a YouTube video I couldn't think of any other way to do that like I said technology is not my jam so somebody probably has a really cool way to get that into a picture I did not um, put everything they needed to know so the card ish um, how I want them to structure their reasons, how they need to write it on their steno, terms, everything. Um, and gave this to them in a binder with a steno and a pencil. And they brought it back to me. Yesterday I had 10 kids at practice and they all had their note, well, maybe not one of them. Nine of them had their notebook, there's always one, right? And their binder with them. So that's kind of how I started the livestock judging component. Um, this might not work everywhere, like at Burns Flat. I had a group of older students who wanted a livestock judge and I was just very upfront with them of like, I'll do it with you the best we can. You are probably a little bit behind and you're gonna have to put in a lot of extra work. They didn't necessarily, that group, wanna put in as much work as it took. So we were there and we showed up and tried, right? Um, so it kind of depends, put that responsibility on the kids and let them meet you where you want them to be, if that makes sense. Um, the last thing really that I have, and then I guess I'll ask questions or entertain questions or whatever. Um, it's kind of dumb, but you can't eat an elephant all in one bite. Like I really last spring or last summer when we started this little 4-h team i was like yeah we're gonna go win like it's gonna be great like they're junior 4-h we got it hmm no okay and so knowing that little steps are good showing up with your binder is good knowing 10 of your floor culture ids out of the 20 i assigned you that's a start right um i guess i can get a little blinded to the fact that i want success immediately 
that's, I mean, I want them to go win. I think if we're worth a darn in our job, we're trying to be successful. Um, sometimes I need to be reminded that they're showing up, they're practicing, they're trying, they're learning, we're building them to be better people. The success will follow eventually. So you can't eat an elephant all in one bite. You may start a meat team and then it falls apart. Um, and then you're really disappointed, right? Because you put all that effort into starting that. But then maybe they get on a different team that you're able to harness some more kids and then that works out, right? Um, so I would say ride any bit of success you can. You can't eat an elephant all in one bite. And do what works for you. Like what works for Mr. Nipper, myself, and Mr. Branson with CDEs for Stillwater FFA. I cannot take this mold and replicate it somewhere else probably. Like I would have to totally reset how I'm doing everything if I was to go somewhere else. So each of you know your program. Like that's why you were hired. You understand it. You've got it. You're great at your job. Figure out what works for you and then start putting these little things in. Um, and finally, I would say find the fun things of the contest. Mr. Branscom trained a poultry judging team. Um, he is, we call him the Prince of Poultry um, at our county show, like our secretary of the expo he calls him the Prince of Poultry. She even made a shirt because he always has so many broilers showing at our county show and loves it. So he trained a poultry team and, you know, those kids were very interested in like the dinosaur chicken nuggets like because they have to id or like judge some different foods and like see if there's a defect or whatever so we brought in dinosaur chicken nuggets the days that we hung the dead carcasses out there um, and they got to see like the dead chicken carcasses maybe wasn't their favorite day but they remembered it and it was interesting and they weren't just sitting in here listening to me want want talk at you right so find the fun things let them do the fun parts of the contest um, and go from there. So, any specific questions? Yes. What are you using for your guide or curriculum on your at home? Picture evaluation. Yep. So, the CIMC is the what they told us most recently. I don't know if they're going to change that with that kind of phasing out. But um, this year they didn't have that little pre-workshop for AgCom because of COVID, but the year before and the year before I went, and she suggests the most updated CIMC is where she's gonna pull test questions and the picture guides. I will say if you're training an AgCom team and you can get them to that OSU workshop, they tell you everything. Like my pen never stopped moving. I took notes the whole time. If we're doing logos, Shelly and her students are gonna tell you this is our priority. So as a judging coach, I'm going, okay, if that's their priority, we're starting with number one of their priority and that's what we're looking for and going down. So if you do train an AgCom team, it's usually January-ish, middle of January on a Saturday. If you can get any of your kids and you to that workshop, it will save you on AgCom. Anything else? No more questions. Y'all are going to be in early. Yes. How do you, as an educator, prepare yourself to teach a team that you maybe don't have any experience? Yeah, that's a great question because I knew nothing about the greenhouse, floriculture, plants, anything. So I was very much deer in the headlights. I would say learn with them and don't be afraid to like not maybe be like you want to be the authority, but maybe it's okay to be like, hey, I'm learning this with you. Um, for floor culture specifically, Alan Smith is at Cushing and he was close. He was here one day teaching his little fanoodle thing to the student teachers. And I was like, hey, I have a floor culture team. Like, what do you even suggest? And so he gave me, I mean, he kind of is still involved with the state, so he can't really, he couldn't give me a lot of stuff that was like, this is what I would do. And I've used that kind of framework throughout the entire time. Um, I read the guidelines every year. I feel like I forget because when we sleep, we forget things. So I'll, I know the OSU resource guidelines are what they're putting the contest on from. So I'll go reread that. Usually the first practice, I go through it with all the kids. So I can remind myself of like, hey, the test is worth this many points. 
the photos are worth this many points or whatever. And so you kind of just have to learn as you go. If anyone puts on like the Ag Calm workshop, go. If you can find somebody that's doing floriculture, like Miss Tillinghouse could probably help, you know, there's those ag teachers and or resources around that you just kind of have to be willing to put in the work to go find them. So. Any other questions? No. Like I said, I know that all of you kind of have your own area. Everybody has a bias when it comes to CDEs. Everybody has something they want to be great at you know that's wonderful and hopefully there's something in here that works to make it better um do what works for you and your program and then it'll be successful from there i don't even know what time it is yeah a couple minutes early um like i said i'll put the adcom graphics and logos in the google drive i'll put this judging book in there as well you're welcome to use any of it or none of it um, but thank you so much for coming um, if you have specific questions, you can come find me up here. Don't leave the room just yet. They've been asking that we stay. Oh.